CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And uh, for the first part of the show, we're going to be joined by Sabres reporter Matthew Fairburn of The Athletic. And uh, here it is on the verge of June, and there is a lot of Sabres hockey to talk about in all kinds of different ways. Of course, the captain, Kyle Ocposo, uh, is uh, re-signed, and he's going to be coming back for another year at $2.5 million. But some excitement in Rochester They're selling out the Blue Cross Arena as the Amherst are maybe the hottest team in hockey right now. And that would include even at the NHL level when you talk about goals being scored and win streaks, et cetera. Uh, A lot of uh, young players doing well. Uh, Sabres are doing well at the World Championships. And while that is a throwaway tournament, and as far as I'm concerned, kind of a bullshit tournament, because how do you hold the World Championships when you don't have the best teams the best players from the best teams on the ice because they're involved in the Stanley cup playoffs. Um, But there's just a lot of cool stuff happening around the Sabres and their development, their trajectory, the future. Um, And I think it's an interesting topic right now, especially with Jack Eichel and Sam Reinhart about to face each other in the Stanley cup final that, For the last 10, 12 years, there's been this FOMO angst that Sabres fans have had regarding Ryan O'Reilly winning the Conn Smythe uh, with the St. Louis Blues, Uh, Linus Allmark leaving and becoming a Vezina favorite uh, on one of the greatest teams in NHL history, no less. Uh, There have been these Sabres players, and it's become almost like a the postseason coverage of the Sabres for the last decade or so has been, where are the former Sabres players going to spit in Buffalo's eye? Uh, and are they, how many are going to raise the cup? How many are going to get, uh, are keep embarrassing our franchise? Speaking from a fan standpoint, but here with Eichel, the most polarizing player perhaps in, well, there've been some polarizing players in Sabres history. Uh, so I don't want to say most of all. It would be a good discussion to have. But he's up there uh, going up against Sam Reinhart, two first-round picks. It seems pretty muted, the angst that is, because there's so much other cool stuff happening. And um, I, I, obviously, Matthew covers the Sabres, and he's been down in Rochester and uh, talking to Coach Appert and some of the players. Jonah's been covering it also. Um, you guys were both on the news conference today, a uh, video conference with Kyle Poso to talk about his new contract. Um, Matthew, I guess we'll start with you as the guest. Just your general thoughts on this, this idea that fans don't seem to be as worked up about it. And Jonah, you were saying earlier before we came on, maybe it's even time that we can root for these guys. I'm t- Again, I'm talking as fans. I don't. Personally, I don't care, uh, but uh, I just want I want I want seven games. I'm tired of sweeps. I'll tell you that in basketball and hockey. Let's see. Let's see a seven game series. I want some freaking drama beyond that. I don't care who wins. Anyway, boys, the floor is yours. I would also like to throw in Jonah and I were both in Rochester for the PGA championship as well. Independently ran into Indeed. each other. You uh, versatile bastards. Yeah, we were not covering it. We were there on on pleasure separately and bumped into each other. Um, and then we were there together. So um, there Since is a lot. we were both there for pleasure, which parts bumped into each other? Well, you know. I was we, looking at a map and all of a sudden I got bumped from behind and <laughs> I heard, hey, buddy. There I was. 
I hope nothing so, got sprained. That was uh, another highlight on the sports calendar. Maybe just a, one more thing to distract people from uh, these NHL playoffs with these two two important figures, right? It's not Brandon Montour against Linus Olmark or something. Important in their own right. And, you know, those two sting in their own right because they've played their best hockey outside of Buffalo. But the two guys that, you know, there was going to be suffering, right? And it was for those two guys. And in a sense, I think you look at it and you say, well, I guess he was right. Like the suffering was worth it because there's two guys that are big contributors on, on Stanley Cup teams, just as everybody hoped and predicted. They're just doing it on the wrong team. And it does bring back some some of the the stench of of Ryan O'Reilly uh drenched in Guinness holding the Conn Smythe trophy uh, on his lap uh shirt unbuttoned the whole deal it it brings some of that back i think i don't i never have a good gauge on you know if enough people on twitter are mad about something especially these days i'm i'm not i don't think i'm on there quite as much so if there was angst i wouldn't maybe pick up on it um that is a great point i just want to put a pin in that conversation so we come back at it i'm the same way i am not on twitter nearly as much as i used to be and i think that is something to factor in because when uh, as a sports journalist uh for the last 14 years since i've been on twitter that was a way that you could keep your finger on the pulse of what fans were thinking even if it was just the vocal minority you could you knew who was feverish you knew who was really worked up which pro or con uh whether it's the pandering mob or the lynch mob uh you knew which what people were worked up about um i'm not anymore so i i think i i probably need to at least factor that into my my calculus of what fans are talking about anyway but you're yeah, right. that's kind of why I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be on. It's gotten to be a, a place I don't want to be. Yeah, that, that's why the premise of people aren't as stressed out about it or worried about it. I I don't know. I I can't really formulate that because I there, I don't have the pulse of enough of the Sabres fans. And um, that's a hard thing to have in general. Right. Um, that maybe would have been a good. Well, I don't even know how I would have framed that question in our Sabres fan survey, um, but I'm working on a column. Maybe that'll give me a better idea. Usually I use our commenters as a as a good base of where people stand on things. But Well, I was going to say there, there's many other ways, whether it's just anecdotally bumping into people, bartenders, people out in the community, Twitter comments on your articles. I don't listen to a lot of local talk radio, but for years that was always kind of the way you gauge the sentiment of the fan base. And I think overall, just walking around in life, you don't hear people, you know, fetching about Jack Eichel and Sam Reinhardt in the way that I think if this had happened two years ago, it, it would have been. I also wonder if the, so the, the cup final being, or even the final four teams being these four Sunbelt franchises, right? These non-traditional hockey markets, this, the buzz of the Stanley Cup final, I think some of it did get taken away because you didn't have the big traditional powerhouse markets going all the way. I think we may see the intensity dialed up just a bit in terms of how Sabres fans feel about it. If and when it gets to that point, you know, Sam Reinhart's already already in with the Panthers uh, finishing off the sweep last night. As we record this, you know, Jack Eichel and the the Golden Knights have not completed the sweep, but could do so Friday night. And maybe once they're playing, I do get the sense that people would be a lot more pissed off to see Jack Eichel win than Sam Reinhart. I think Sam Reinhart was a sympathetic enough figure. You know, he he had his his moments with with some members of the media but i don't think fans really cared about that and he wasn't quite as vocal 
he wasn't sort of the face of this whole tank. Um, he was just another piece. Um, and he contributed pretty well. He was a good player. He wanted out. I don't think anybody blamed him for wanting out. But I do think if you look at these trades, that trade in particular, uh, you've got Devin Levi came back in that trade and Yuri Kulik came back in that trade. And the early results in our Sabres fan survey at The Athletic right now, I asked which prospect not named Devin Levi people were most excited about, thinking Matt Savoy would probably be the one after the year he had. Yuri Kulik is currently ahead of him in that. Like People are pretty jacked about about what he's doing. So to get those two back is not not bad at all for Sam Reinhart. And Sam Reinhart is not the reason the Panthers are winning. He's one of the reasons, but Matthew Kachuk and, and Sergei Bobrovsky are uh, a notch above in the Conn Smythe power rankings over there. Jack Eichel could win the Conn Smythe if sure. Vegas wins the cup. If Vegas wins the cup, I think he does. I think he's looking, he's more than a point per game. Um, of course, he's going to have to have a good series. I mean, if, if Vegas just wins the cup and he has uh, two goals and three assists, that might not do it. But yeah, if he, he if he stays he's, warm, he's, right he's, in the been, mix. he's been playing very well here over the last two weeks. So that, I think, adds a layer of it's Jack, and a lot of people feel a certain way about Jack. And one of the big knocks on Jack, you mentioned him being polarizing. One of the big things was he has such a bad attitude, and he'll never be the type of guy that can lead a team to a Stanley Cup. Well, here he is. And he's kind of carrying the Knights to the Stanley Cup. And there are other pieces, and he needed to sort of be not the captain and not the face of the franchise and not this or that, but he's their most valuable player right now. And they're on the verge. They look like a team that that could do it. So I would guess that you will see more of the fan uh, intensity when the Stanley Cup is actually happening. We know Buffalo is one of the highest rated markets in the Stanley Cup each year. And my guess is there will be many, many people rooting against Jack Eichel. And that's where it will kind of show up. I don't know that people were necessarily rooting against Ryan O'Reilly so much as it was a, oh no, like this is going to happen to us now. This, you know, this is what's going to happen. So, well, I think there was bitterness over the concept. Uh, in the statement that really got him traded when he said he had lost his love for the game and Sabres fans were pretty much unanimous and it was forgotten about once Ryan O'Reilly started doing well and everybody wanted to blame Jason Bottrell for not getting good return on the Ryan O'Reilly trade as they watched him go win the Conn Smythe. I think it was an indictment on Bottrell from the fans, number one, uh, and it allowed them to raise the pitchforks. Um I would but say Ryan O'Reilly, when he says he lost his love for the game and it was pretty much mandated that he be traded off this roster uh, by the fans and management, um, I think fans were done with Ryan O'Reilly. How? You, what do you mean? You're supposed to be our leader and you lost your love for the game. You get paid all this money. But then I think it became a convenient pivot for uh, fans disliking him as a quitter to – oh, wow, this guy is really good. How come we couldn't get that out of him? And Bottrell gave him away for nothing. And, of course, Bottrell looks quite a bit different now that Tage Thompson has evolved in, in ways that nobody could have really foreseen. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, the, the Ryan O'Reilly pivot was was fascinating to me. Joan, I you were about to say some, something. Like well, I, I would just want to say, I think thinking back to that, I think there was some perverse way that many Sabres fans and observers – if they weren't rooting for Ryan O'Reilly, they kind of were watching it unfold in, in a way that, you know, we we don't want Ryan O'Reilly to win, but, oh, look, at he, he's going to win. And what, what this says about how this reflects on the Sabres and what kind of point it proves in people's heads about how the Sabres were mismanaged or bad luck or players' careers come here to die, and then when they leave here, they get better. I, I don't know if people were that mad that Ryan O'Reilly won. I think they were more mad at the Sabres for – yeah. getting caught up in that kind of situation and putting their fans through that emotional state. And maybe that happens if Jack Eichel's skating around, holding the Stanley Cup atop his head. But, you know, as Fairburn broke down with the Sam Reinhardt trade 
in retrospect, looking like the Sabres did very well for themselves in that deal. And also the Jack Eichel trade, it seems like, you know, we, we've broken down the different players they got there. And it seems like the Sabres have built almost half of this lineup from trading away those two players. And Ryan O'Reilly can be included in that. And a lot of the star players have come from those trades. And, and the Sabres have gotten to a much better place as a roster and a franchise and the fan base was maybe slower to uh, get to that, but they're in a much healthier place where it's really just about rooting for the team and the future of the team and the good vibes going on with players on the roster and Kyle Posa re-signing than it is worrying about what former Sabres are doing elsewhere. And I think I don't think that there's that big of a leap to get from the, the mentality of rooting for your team to lose at home, I'm talking about the tank season heading into the Jack Eichel, Connor McDavid draft, uh, cheering for the Coyotes to win, um, the, you know, the joy that people had of the Sabres to lose to the fans who were rooting for Ryan O'Reilly to actually probably some of them to get it done because the more success Ryan O'Reilly had in that postseason with the St. Louis Blues the worse the Sabres looked and let's blow this shit up because they were fed up and they're still fed up. Uh, maybe less so uh, in terms of their, uh, their fervor, but still fed up of not making the postseason. Uh, but at that time, I think that people just wanted heads to roll and it wasn't going to matter if it was Jason Bottrell or if it was Murray or whomever it was just, or Terry Pagula, please sell the team, you know, whatever it was. Um, and it, anyways, it, it added, it was part of the toxicity. I think, I think that there were, there were a, a segment, a strong segment of Sabres fans that were rooting for Ryan O'Reilly to go ahead and do it, uh, because it, it was maybe because it was funny, uh, because it was the same as probably sending Rory Fitzpatrick to the all-star game. Like, well, this is all we have, man. We've got to find ways to have fun. Somehow we got to throw our dildos on the field. Uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and let Ryan O'Reilly win this and make us look even worse. And then maybe some, somebody will fire the the right guy and we'll bring in a, a replacement that, that gets it done. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just so refreshing to have the Sabres in this situation, despite missing the playoffs again. Uh, and I think we have Devin Levi to thank because had he not shown up, I think we'd be looking at pissed off fans of not making the postseason. Uh, but Devin Levi gef left that good taste in the mouth, same as a year ago when fans were still excited about the Sabres' future despite missing the postseason. And also Yuri Kulik doing things in Rochester that Sabres fans can watch, either on TV or if it just being on the minor league club and in an adjacent sister city. Because if Yuri Kulik was the same prospect and the same talent, but he was off playing in the KHL and we really didn't know how good he was or what he was doing, there would be a lot less fan understanding of that was a good trade. Now they can see that he's good and kind of interpret it in a way that makes more sense to a Western New York hockey fan than it would have if this was a prospect or still playing in college that you didn't know how good he was going to be. Matthew, yeah, what's is. your take of uh, what's been going on down in Rochester? Uh, playoff fever. Uh, I, I think for me, we have to go back to the – um, 04, 05 season, uh, that was when the NHL was in the lockout. The Sabres had a lot of NHL caliber talent that was on the verge of coming up. The difference I see just to, from my, you know, from my career and my coverage, it, you know, only a, a few of these guys are, have a chance of being on the roster next year. Whereas in 0, 04, 05, you had players with NHL experience who already had established themselves as regulars with the Sabres who had minor league eligibility, could go down there and play. And it was almost like a wholesale plug and play. And obviously Briere and Drury, and they had other key components that weren't on the Amherst that season, but you had so many, Ryan Miller, Vanek, Roy, Gostad. Uh, I think, I don't know, Kota Leek was maybe down there even playing, um, I'd have to go back and look. Maybe I'll look here, but it was pretty much, it was a ton of guys. Now it's a little different, but the excitement and what's being established down there um, that these guys are getting a taste of winning and playing deep into the playoffs is healthy. Yeah. The big difference probably from the last group is that, you know, in the lockout season, there was no real 
you didn't have wandering eyes, right? You weren't sitting there saying, I want to be up in the NHL. Like those guys were just down and playing. Um, but they were good the year before down there too. And I do think it matters. Uh, I think Seth Appert has talked about, you know, he and Kevin Adams having the philosophy when Appert was hired that you can win with your prospects. Winning is important in the AHL, but not so important that it comes at the expense of playing your young, talented prospects. And they're getting the best of both worlds right now. A lot of teams load up on a AHL lifers, real good AHL older players that can help them win AHL games. The Sabres are getting here, be, or the, the Amherst are getting here because of, you know, Yuri Kulik, Isak Roseanne, Lukash Rusek. Like, these are young, rising prospects in the system getting important minutes. And I think that's a pretty big deal. And you can even tie it into what we were just talking about with these players who are winning elsewhere and who are going into these other environments and thriving because winning is sort of already part of the program there. And not only that, but they're going places where they're excited to go because winning is sort of part of the program. And Kevin Adams has talked a lot about wanting players who want to be in Buffalo. And it sounds like a given, or it sounds like, you know, this empty trope or whatever, but I feel like Jack Eichel and Sam Reinhart and Ryan O'Reilly underscore how important that is. You need to stop being in a spot where your back is against the wall on trades with these guys who establish themselves, don't want to be here, whatever. And then you have, you're forced to get whatever you can. And they've done well in all those trades. But I think the way you do that, one of the only ways you can do that is to draft and develop from within. You're not beating out Florida or Vegas or Anaheim or LA for every free agent. There are certain geographical destinations that are going to be more attractive than Buffalo. That's just until you become a winner, that's just the reality. But if you can grow it from within and you have guys like Dylan Cousins, Tage Thompson, who sort of develop in your system and then say, yeah, this is where I want to be for a long time. And they set that tone. Alex Tuck is setting that tone. One of the pieces of, of that Eichel deal. And then you have it cooking in Rochester the way it is. You know, Seth Appert mentioned when he and I were talking a few weeks ago about JJ Paterka having a big game in the NHL and he's doing his post game media and he's got his Amherst undershirt on still. Uh, and Appert showed that to the team. And then Jack Quinn all season long was texting Seth Appert about certain plays and games in Amherst games. He was watching Amherst games all year, you know, like they care about that group. And, you know, Matias Samuelson came up there, Uko Pekalukinen, uh, you know, these guys that are learning to care about one another, learning to win. I think it's, it's somewhat essential to, to getting to that point in the NHL. And you have, to your point, you know, the, the experience these guys are getting is really probably number one, uh, out of all of this is that Yuri Kulik is like being counted on in playoff series as what he's doing as a, in his draft plus one year as a teenager in this league is historically, you know, he's like one of one almost, uh, the way he's playing mostly because not a lot of teenagers play in the league, but still every week that they keep playing is more games for Yuri Kulik. It's a new experience for him. It's, it's a new experience for, for Isak Roseanne. It's a possibility for Matthew Savoy to get into a game after his WHL season ended. And he just had a long postseason run. So all of those things I think are a big deal and it's, you know, contributes to the, uh, the good feelings Sabres fans have about what's being built. Because again, it's another feather in the cap, I think, of Kevin Adams. You can go back when he fired Chris Taylor, probably not necessarily of his own 
you know, they had to trim a lot of staff uh, at the beginning of the pandemic when Kevin Adams took over and all that. And they didn't know if the Amherst would be playing, whatever. It was a surprise that Chris Taylor got fired. He was a good coach. He goes and hires Seth Appert, who I think has been an absolute home run for that Amherst team. And it's just another sign that he knows what he's doing. And even in these, you know, I think that is probably more than anything why you see that lack of lack of angst, lack of the Eichel leading angst. scorer on that 0405 team that I referenced was Chris Taylor. Uh, cra- classic 4A player. He was there. I believe he was the captain. You know, the uh, he was the guy that they wanted down there to help teach uh, some of these young guys. By the way, I, I mentioned Kotalik. Not true. Uh, so let me just give some of those names. Uh, Ryan Miller, goal, uh, goalie uh, for 63 games that year uh, in the regular season. So obviously he got a lot of work ahead of Town of Tonawanda native Tom Askey. But uh, you had NHLers, um, Derek Roy, uh, Jason Pominville, Thomas Vanek, Clark MacArthur, Daniel Paye, Yuri Novotny, uh, who was a trade uh, uh, chip, uh, Norm Milley, Chris Thorburn that I mentioned, Paul Gostad, um, Doug Janik, Nathan Page, Rory Fitzpatrick, uh, Jeff Gilson of 06 uh, Eastern Conference Finals fame. So a lot of guys who ended up um, you know, with a lot of NHL experience. Uh, playing in those games together uh, and eight regular season games for that uh, team, although didn't play in the playoffs, Jason Bottrell. So both Jason Bottrell and Chris Taylor were on that uh, 04, 05 uh, Amherst team. Um, I don't know. Interesting. Just wanted to to mention all that since you brought up Chris Taylor, the great 4A player, uh, much like uh, a Denny Hamel. Uh, a really strong AHL player, Jason Bottrell, another great 4A player, um, but not too swift at the NHL level or not good enough. Well, the Amherst have found a good blend this year with a few of those guys like Michael Mersh, you know, and guys that are the type of older veteran player that some of the young guys can learn from. They can obviously contribute at the AHL level. They probably don't have the same NHL hopes and dreams uh, that Yuri Kulik and, and Isak Roseanne have, but they are certainly valuable contributors. Part of the reason, and Malcolm Subban, an, another one, you know, they're getting great goaltending and maybe Malcolm Subban can, can find his way back to the NHL. I wouldn't put it past him. Uh, it's a, one of those positions where teams are always looking for an answer and any spark you can provide uh, he's certainly shown that he can he can handle it uh, at times in the past. So finding that right blend, it's worked really well for them. It was a couple of weeks ago, I made a visit up there before before what would have been, I think, game five against Syracuse, wondering, you know, I better get up there, you know, one more time in case they lose. And then they've just gone on a heater. Uh, you know, it's been been incredible to to see what they've been able to do and that they're doing it with guys that people have heard of and guys that people are eager to see in a Sabres uniform even Lukas Ruschek who's you know got up for a game and played really well I think there's he and Yuri Kulik people have legitimate hope that they'll be able to play for the Sabres next season and so that doesn't even count, you know, Isak Rozan and Tyson Kozak, who's another young player playing a really important role. Maybe, you know, one or more of those guys is a trade chip at some point. Um, but I think Lucas Ruschek is a lock for the roster next year. He And that, you know, is interesting because I don't know if Yuri Kulik will make it. I think he has a really good chance and, you know, we'll see how his summer goes and how he shows up to camp. But when you start to look at how the puzzle fits together, there's not that many open spots, right? Like, and so if if Rusak makes it, the and Kulik makes it, that's kind of your forward group, right? Unless you know, and then you got to move. Somebody's got to move out. So Victor Olafson uh, is a prime trade chip, but uh, you know Zemgis Gergensen's 
is an unrestricted free agent. Tyson Jost is a restricted free agent. So there's ways to make room. But for those hoping a for a big name addition at forward, uh, you know, the top six looks pretty set. I could understand the argument for adding a little bit more experience and uh and you know defense to the bottom six uh, of the forward group, but I think it depends how they feel about these guys. And another reason it's valuable for them to go deep is just more looks at who these guys are. Maybe a look at Matthew Savoy uh in tonight in in one of these games. So it's like that's where you know, you get an extended look at Savoy in this setting after a long WHL playoff, you start to get a better picture of where he is going into the summer and whether he can crack your roster because it is juniors or uh, the NHL for him, given his age and uh, the cutoff there. There's ways they could play with it the way Seattle did with Shane Wright this year, but that's a big decision that impacts what you do in free agency. So I don't know if forwards... I don't know that they'll be they'll be super active. They already have a lot of contracts. There's not a lot of room on this roster. There's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of carryover to what they do, and I, but I still think the Amherst are going to be super interesting, not just this year, but going forward. As long as they can hang on to Seth Appert, who I think has really done a terrific job, and they have a couple of the Russians are coming over: Victor Nuchev, uh, Nikita Novikov. Um, they got Komarov under, uh, contract today. He's already in North America cause he was playing in the, the QMJHL. So he could conceivably join the team here. Um, and Noah Oslin is another first round pick that maybe comes in place for the Amherst next year. Maybe he stays in Sweden, but they're going to have you've another written about the Russians and the, um, the diplomacy that needs to take place. Any concerns on these prospects and their ability to remain in the United States, given what's going on uh, with the war uh, against Ukraine and all of the socio-political strings that are being pulled, uh, both in Russia and out. I would say my concern is less now than it was a few months ago, because they're getting these guys under contract. And I think that's the number one the number one concern that across generations uh, on this issue is can you get those guys to sign and stay but is signing enough that doesn't uh, doesn't the russian government have to allow them to leave or not call them back and say you're not allowed to you're not allowed to go play in the united yes, states there's always that possibility i think from what I've gathered on the issue, pen to paper is a, is a pretty big deal. It's a pretty good indicator of that a lot of that has been sorted out. But to your point, things can change with a phone call, right? Things can change with the whim of somebody who, you know, there's so many family issues that that come into play. There's, you know, socio-political issues. There's, there's a lot, but I, I think, you know, in writing those stories, I was trying to illustrate what I think has sort of come to fruition in the last couple of weeks was that they're trying to create a, a pipeline for lack of a, a better term so that those guys are comfortable coming over. And I give Alexander Kisikov a lot of credit for being the first one to come over, um, reached out to the Sabres, said he wanted to come and he wanted to get under contract and, and wanted to play in North America. And he had to come over here all by himself, be the only Russian in Rochester. He was, you know, he had Ilya Labushkin with him in training camp. So that was a big resource, but there's no Russian speakers in Rochester, staff, players, none. So he had to be the first. It's easier for all the other guys that that come. I think every offseason, every NHL team, AHL team, whatever, that has these guys is going to be wondering. When they go home, assuming they go home, are they going to be able to come back? It didn't seem like it was a huge issue last year, despite a lot of fears about it. And interestingly, you know, I was talking to Steven Serdarian, who's not 
has not signed an entry level deal with the Sabres. He's at University of New Hampshire uh, right now. He's been in America for two years, played in the USHL, and then played uh, at UNH. He'll be at development camp. And he actually, as of when we spoke in, it was like November, I think I went out there. He was not even planning to go back. He wasn't sure that he'd be able to make it back to Russia and he didn't want to risk missing development camp. So he was not totally convinced that he would do it. So I don't know. It's going to be, it's interesting because it was sort of this move where they, they drafted more Russians in the last two drafts than they had in like the 16 or 17 drafts combined before that. But they have seen no results from it. It was, it was always going to be sort of this slow, steady pro process. Arguably the most exciting player of the bunch, Prokhor Poltapov, is still under contract for another year. And that's anybody's guess as to what he'll do, you know, beyond that, that season. So I would say there's always going to be concern of something happening that prevents guys from getting here or delays them getting here, but getting them under contracts, a nice first step, number one. And number two, they are not set up to a point where they desperately need any of these guys right away. So they have laid a pretty good foundation to where these guys, I think that's a big deal with Russian players when teams are deciding whether to draft them. It's like, can you put up with the uncertainty of not signing them? Number one, can you put up with the timeline, the lengthy timeline that it often takes to get these guys over here? And a lot of general managers sit there and think, oh yeah, you know, this Russian player looks great, you know? Kaprizov is a great example. It took him a long time to become a member of the Minnesota Wild. He was basically an instant superstar. How many GMs in the league can sit there on draft day and say, if this guy takes six years, five or six years, that's all right. A lot of them are sitting there and saying, well, shit, I hope I have this job in five or six years. I can't be waiting for this kid to get over here. Uh, and, you know, you do see kids making an impact and uh, you know, their first year, second year, third year. So the Sabres had the benefit of having that time and having that runway. And now they have such an embarrassment of riches in their prospect pool that it's like, absolutely take your time. Come Alexander Kisikov, get over here. We'll get you in the weight room. We'll not put too much on your plate too soon. And now when other guys come over, they have somebody who speaks the language. They have a staff full of people who have dealt with the cultural shift that these guys have to make and can help them through it so i would say i'm not overly concerned but mostly because it's all a guessing game right you know it's like how things are going to go for these guys over the summer is is really anybody's guess and that's uh that's the chance the sabers have taken here well, we have a lot to get to, uh, including Bill's OTAs, the Bandits, Jesse Pagula in the French Open, Anquan Bolden Jr. going to UB, St. Francis High offensive lineman going to Georgia and play for the Bulldogs. So we got a lot to get to, but while we still have Matthew Fairburn here, Jonah, anything else you want to bring up that's uh, Sabres related? Did we miss anything, guys? I guess, what are your thoughts on Oposo returning? There are a lot of people who are ready to turn the page and have Rasmus Dahlin or Alex Tuck become the next captain. I personally think Dahlin will be the next captain. I know that people like Tuck because he's a Sabres fan and he's a very good player and the whole thing and sets a tone. And um, But I also like the idea of Kyle Oposo coming back for a year. I think he deserves a chance to experience the playoffs with a team that he helped turn around after Ralph Kruger got fired. And he still seems to have quite a bit of value in that dressing room. Uh, even though his, uh, his, his production or his, his, uh, ice time has, uh, waned a bit, but he's still on the, all the different units and playing, playing key minutes. I don't know. I'll throw it out there for you guys, whatever you think. Do you really think what you just said at the top there that a lot of people didn't want him back because they wanted? No, I don't. I don't. Uh, well, I, no, I don't think a lot of people didn't want him back, but I think they see all the things that we were just talking about. And if there's a guy that they could uh, supplant. So one of these younger kids, like a yearly, if you were to say to a, the average Sabres fan, 
uh, or I guess you'd have to pay attention to the prospects. Um, the only way Yuri Kulich can come up and play is if Kyle Ocposo is not on the roster anymore. They would say, okay, see ya. Thanks for, thanks for your service, Kyle. Uh, let's get one of these young guys up here. But no, I don't think that there's an anti Kyle Ocposo sentiment out there or backlash. I just think that there are also people who see him as a captain and think your captain is supposed to be performing at a very high level. So there are people who would maybe like to see Ocposo go ahead and play on the fourth line, but give the C to somebody else. I think there's all kinds of different ways he's viewed, and it's through that prism of wearing the C on his sweater. I think it's important, if I could just say real quick, that they brought him back for many reasons. But one particular reason, because of his age and his leadership role and the fact that Craig Anderson's retiring, Zemgus Gergensen's maybe from a roster standpoint, they don't bring him back. Maybe they do, but it, that seems to make a little bit less sense. Um, the Sabres had a risk of being the youngest team in the NHL last year and getting even younger going into next year if they replace too many of their older players with prospects. Devin Levi being 20 years younger than Craig Anderson, their overall average age isn't going to be much older next year. And that might not keep them from being a playoff team. But if you don't mature and you don't have enough age and experience in the locker room and on the team, it could derail a little bit of the progress. So I think bringing back Kyle Oposo because he's such an important personality and leader solves that age dilemma, I think, on its own. I think that one signing uh, mitigates any of that risk of the locker room and the team being too young and too fresh and too inexperienced next year. As important as his leadership was during this, you know, building phase, it's almost more important to have somebody like that when you're, going to deal with expectations and even on his conference call this morning he was not shy about saying just getting to the playoffs isn't good enough like they think they're close to getting to the top of the mountain that's how they and i think it's good to have somebody who's not afraid to say that this early this you know far ahead of when they actually step on the ice and i think it's good to have a guy who understands that that's okay and how to handle it and all those things like his leadership is going to be even more important if you got rid of kyle Ocposo, you were going to be looking for another player who description wise probably sounded a lot like kyle Ocposo, right like i don't think you were replacing him in the lineup with matt savoy or, or yuri kulik because you're going to need some age and experience and, and leadership it's a long season there's going to be ups and downs i understand i think tim is right in his instinct that there is a bit of an anti Ocposo sentiment. There's a lot of people that think he doesn't have it anymore. And Kyle seems to think that he didn't play up to his own standard last year and that he has a lot more to give offensively. And he's got some ideas about how to handle his off season to, to get back to that level. 2.5 million. Is it a little bit much? Maybe, but the cap doesn't really matter this year in particular because of the way their roster is set up and how much cap space they have. So giving them an extra 750,000 or whatever, or 500,000, uh, I think he's and earned that's it. That's not a lot. I think that it's makes not. him the 12th highest no. paid skater and is a 60% pay cut from he was, you know, yeah, on if you, a big contract, I think but if you compare it to the 6 million he was making, it looks like a bargain. If you compare it to other 35, 36 year old players who had his point total, you might say oh, a little much, but he's also the captain. Uh, and people know what he means on and off the ice in that role. So I'm totally okay with the number. And I just think there's, you know, it, it would have been really hard to replace him. Not that they don't have worthy candidates in the room for captain, but it's even better for Rasmus Dahlin to become captain way after he's obviously ready, right? Like, it'll be so obvious that Rasmus Dahlin is the captain or Alex Tuck. I think it'll probably be Rasmus Dahlin, but I know a lot of people are, are pulling for Alex Tuck to be that guy, but it'll be so obvious as opposed to in the past when it was like, well, this guy has to be the captain, even though he's or 20, I hope this guy's years a good old. captain. Right. Or we I hope give this him guy's captain, captain material. Because everything rests on him, so we might as well make him the captain. And that sometimes works out for franchises, sometimes does not. It didn't work out for Jack Eichel very well, I don't think, and didn't work out for the Sabres. So the reason they have these good young leaders emerging, I think, in part, is because of the way they've been able to learn from Kyle Ocposo. And if he were to leave 
to Jonah's point, with Craig Anderson leaving and maybe Zemgus Gergensen's too, you are suddenly an extremely inexperienced team. Forget age. You have very few guys who have been through it. They already, I already think they have a big need for somebody who has played, preferably won a Stanley Cup. But well, playing in a sold out Blue Cross arena is not going to be the same as playing in a sold out Madison Square Garden. Steve uh, Wino had a great uh, study before the playoffs about the number of teams in the playoffs that had a former cup winner. I think it was 14 of 16 had a former cup winner on their roster. I think it matters. I, I, I looked around that room at times at the end of the year and thought, who here has been through it? Alex Tuck has played in the playoffs, Akposo, you know, a little bit, but nobody's won one. So not only are you really young, but you're really just lacking that that critical experience. So yeah, losing Akposo from that, I still think he's got a little bit left in the tank. He was a terrific defensive player last year. Could stand to bring more on offense, but they didn't really need more on offense last year. That wasn't an issue. So more yeah, on offense. <laughs> exactly. That's the Ralph Kruger <laughs> way, the more on <laughs> offense. Another thing with Akposo that it goes beyond hockey and, and locker room leadership that, that's on the ice or related to on the ice. I mean, he's just he's a 35 year old who's been in Buffalo for seven years going into his eighth year. Just new players coming in and wondering where to rent apartments, wondering where to buy suits, what restaurants to go to, how to become Buffalonians or Western New Yorkers. And Kyler Posa probably embraces this better than maybe anybody else that I've seen around this team in the last 10, 12, 15 years, that he is a proponent. He's almost a chamber of commerce in a way for Buffalo Sabres hockey. And when new players come in and young players rise in the ranks, he's a good example and a good ambassador for the culture that the Sabres want to set. And if he's here for another year only, or even maybe two years, that next captain gets another year or two of watching how Kyle Oposo led this team and was a captain. And whether it's Rasmus Dahlin, Alex Tuck, maybe even Dylan Cousins, I think could be in that conversation someday. When they become captain, when they get that C on their sweater, they're going to say in their own head, I'm going to do this the way Kyle Oposo did. And as long as the Sabres are happy with the type of captain that Kyle Oposo has been, I think you run it back with him at least another season and really for as long as he can still get in the lineup and be a player for you. There's an air of professionalism, I think, that when... So Kyle Oposo is a, yeah, represented by CAA, one of the big agencies in hockey, and there's something about walking into that room as a new guy when Kyle Ocposo is the captain. Uh, speaking even as a member of the media who was a new guy walking in there and you look around and it's like, who are the guys that are going to be spokespeople for this team? Who are the guys that are leading the way that are, you know, kind of setting the tone. And if you're a new guy, you know, whether it's attracting new players to Buffalo making it a place that people want to play going back to the start of this conversation where you have these guys that just get so sick of being there. You want it to be a place people want to play. And I think Kyle Ocposo has a big role in that, whether people see it or not. And you think about new guys walking in and you'd look around that locker room without Kyle Ocposo and you might wonder that, right? I mean, Alex Tuck is, is one of those guys for sure, whether he wears a letter or not, he's man of the people. He's a, a guy that's just easy to talk to and, uh, I'm sure is is one of the most welcoming guys to the to the new guys. Tage Thompson is starting to grow into that. You know, people mention Darlene and Cousins all the time, but Tage Thompson is a worthy letter guy at some point down the road. But Kyle Ocposo just has a completely different air about him because of his age and his experience. So I think it is, you know, his message matters throughout the league. You know, when his agency feels like, you know, he talks to the younger players in that agency. He talks to a lot of players around the league that matters. And so if they paid him a little more than some people were comfortable with, that's again, Kevin Adams showing respect to a guy that has earned a hell of a lot of it. And it, maybe it's a little bit of the tax of, of being Buffalo and the losing and all that, that you do need to show that how much you treat players the right way, treat people like Kyle Ocposo the right way because of how people around the league feel about him. And all of that, I think, matters a, a great deal in bringing him back and, and paying him what they paid him and all that because he he, ta he talks to people, right? He's 
he's a, an important voice in the league, in the PA, you know, and a lot of stuff. So um, I think his his story and his message will resonate and maybe Buffalo becomes a little bit more an attractive place to play because of it. Matthew Fairburn of The Athletic, thanks for joining us to talk Sabre stuff. That's uh, I'm just not used to this on May 25th. Yeah, we're almost uh, almost a year to the day that I started covering Sabres. So well, I'd say I'm, I'm fully used to now. Happy anniversary. Talking the Sabres. But yeah, this late was uh, maybe this time next year we'll be talking playoff games. Well, we'll cut you loose here. Jonah and right. I are going to talk about Stefan Diggs not being at OTAs, Matt Ariza working out with the Jets. We got all kinds of stuff we want to get to. But Matt Fair, we also know that you are chasing hockey stories because there are hockey stories to be told. That's right. Hockey has not at OTAs. I skipped them. Nor was I because I was writing a hockey story this week. The it way should uh, it should it publish should Friday morning. I look forward to it. Uh, Matthew, thank you for this. Talk to you guys uh, soon. Good to see you. Take care. Uh, we are going to take a break here, and uh, we're going to come back, and Jonah and I are going to get to all that other stuff that I had mentioned here on Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you. Welcome back. Thanks again to Matthew Fairburn. Uh, Jonah, a lot of stuff going on around Western New York. The Bandits are in the lacrosse finals. Jesse Pagula about to play in the French Open. Anquan Bolden to UB. Marcus Harrison to Georgia. And uh, Bills, OTAs, uh, voluntary workouts. Stefan Diggs didn't show up. You start. You pick a starting spot. Where do you where do you want to start? Let's start with the Bills. I mean, the Bills are always the hot button issue 12 months out of the year, regardless of what's going on elsewhere in the sporting landscape, I would think. I don't know if I feel that way, but that yeah, I think a lot, a lot of people do. I mean, you mentioned Stefan Diggs not being at the OTAs. I'm curious what you think. I would say it's not – I don't think it's an issue if it's just Stefan Diggs being a star player who isn't – doesn't feel it's necessary to be practicing at this time of year or, you know, certain players reach a status where they have the privilege of not attending OTAs. I don't think that's an issue if that's what's going on with Stefan Diggs. But obviously there's a lot of subtext and – scrutiny over whether he's unhappy with the bills the way the season ended some of the things that he may have said or not said in cryptic tweets and without having heard Stefan Diggs in Buffalo talking to local media since the end of the season you know there's there's worry over why Stefan Diggs is not attending the OTAs I think more players should not go to OTAs uh quite frankly uh they are voluntary and if you don't want to go, you shouldn't have to go. And if it's not in the contract that they have to be there now, is it better if he's there? Yes. Uh, I think it's better for the team on a holistic basis on the offense for the young receivers to be around him and to learn a little bit from him to uh, whatever uh, introductory purposes uh, for he and Josh Allen I don't I don't think they need to build a rhythm. They have it down. The offense is the same. I don't think that 
Stefan Diggs is going to regress because he has missed a voluntary workout or two. Um, not that big a deal to me. I don't think it's significant. Um, but should like, he, let me ask you this, because nobody seemed to be too worried. Matt Milano wasn't at the OCA on Tuesday either. And Mitch Morris was there, but didn't participate. And Latavius Murray running back that recently just signed wasn't there. So it's not veteran players, not attending OTAs isn't a big deal on its own, but should Stefan Diggs show up at OTAs because of the message that it sends to the bills and the fans and the show of support, almost like, yeah, I think it's healthy. I think it's healthier for your team, but I don't think it's a setback. I think it's, it maybe helps the other players more than it helps Stefan Diggs. So yeah, I guess we can quibble as to whether it is significant because if if it is a positive that he is there, uh, the fact that he isn't, does that mean he is, taking the bills for granted or that he is uh, 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 shirking any kind of leadership duties uh, that he may have as a, as a locker room veteran captain type, whatever. Um, Yeah, I suppose so. Um, Even if it's just for the photo op, I think at some point in this off season, it's important for Stefan Diggs to show up and smile and pat Josh Allen on the back and, quiet that narrative unless he wants that he does not want to quiet that narrative which I don't know if I'd be all that worried about Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen's relationship but the longer this festers and lingers out in the public sphere the more there maybe is potential to worry about that yeah I get that Uh, you know we're at the start of these voluntary workouts if it drags on of course you know, we had uh, Jordan Poyer, uh, who uh, didn't uh, show up for voluntary workouts a year ago because he wanted a new contract. We haven't heard anything really out of Stefan Diggs regarding New Deal, trade request, um, demands for uh, uh, personnel changes, um, going to Sean McDermott about the playbook. I mean, we haven't heard any of that. We just saw what we did when the season ended in which he – stormed out of the locker room before Sean McDermott was able to give his locker room speech. Many of the coaches uh, hadn't come down from the press box yet. He needed to be um, pretty much coaxed back into the locker room uh, by uh, who was it? It was a practice squad player. I'm drawing a blank. I think it was Isaiah McKenzie, right? No, no, no. It was a practice squad guy, Duke Johnson. Uh, Duke Johnson came out, came after him out into the tunnel to get him to come back inside he left his bag right there in the tunnel, went in, probably listened to McDermott. I mean, he was back out in, a, in about a minute, a minute and a half. Uh, he was out of there. Um, and uh, has, yeah, the cryptic tweets. I will say that I, I, this is the one thing that I am really sick of. Um, the, the tea leaf reading of social media. And I know that we talked about it. We've been talking about it with DeAndre Hopkins. Um, we, we talk about it with Von Miller. I mean, Von Miller says a lot of things that people take as gospel and he's blatantly wrong. I mean, whether it's Odell Beckham jr, the fact that his knee is fine enough and he's not, doesn't need surgery and he's going to play, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks or whatever. And then he has surgery and he's done for the year. Um, all these things that he likes to say, there's a big trade that's about to happen a bit, you know, whatever the hell he does that everybody eats. Uh, just right out of the palm of his hand. And he's proven time and again uh, that he's wrong, uh, that he doesn't know. He's, he's a wishful thinker. He likes to think things out loud. He likes to, uh, he likes perhaps uh, forcing a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, The next time he gets it right will be one of the first times uh, he gets it right. Um, But the DeAndre Hopkins stuff, just because he says he would love to play for Josh Allen, therefore he's coming to the Bills. Um, It's just the Buffalo Soldier tweet, which was feels like eons ago. Um, Anybody who, you know, that's things that I think Bills fans aren't used to because the Bills haven't been good and they were irrelevant for so long. The idea that another player likes you uh, or that even a media member uh, even if there's a, a Kyle Brandt out there who really likes the Bills, p- the Bills fans swoon like, oh, my God, these people like us. Uh, it's pandering to a degree. Uh, but I think that it's so welcoming and it's kind of unusual maybe for Bills fans to be uh, uh, admired. 
uh, that they overreact uh, to uh, every uh, every flirtation and, and take it as fact. And it's going to happen. Get it done, Brandon Bean. That's really kind of who I think it hurts. It hurts Bill's management because people assume that these deals are in the works. And if they don't come to pass, then how did Bean fail? Why does ba- why does Brandon Bean keep failing in his in in this pursuit of DeAndre Hopkins? Well, probably because there is no pursuit of DeAndre Hopkins. Um, you know, but anyways, like that's that's where I get tired of it as a media member. And, and you hear about it from fans. They slide into your DMs or they send you an email or they tweet at something. Why aren't you reporting about DeAndre Hopkins? You know, why isn't this deal being done? Why, you know, it fill in the blank. Um, and it's not just DeAndre Hopkins, it's other players too. And you're just like, cause it's, cause it's not happening. The and funny now thing maybe though, a, what's that? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the classic examples of that is Stefan Diggs eating wings at Duff's and all the rumors about that. And why aren't we using that clue as to whether the bills are trying to trade for Stefan Diggs and they don't trade for him in that moment, but six months later in the off season, it does seem like some of that social media sleuthing might, I, that might've been a coincidence, but it also might've been a clue. But all the, the follow or Stephon the Diggs game. talking with his brother on social media, they're tweeting to each other and people saying, oh, Tavon Diggs and Stephon Diggs are going to get reunited. And is 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 uh, is Diggs, is his brother coming to the Bills? No, no, maybe Stephon Diggs is going to the Cowboys. It's like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, and reading a, a lot into who players follow on Instagram or suddenly unfollow on Instagram and – you know, I get the urge to that, and I think sometimes that can tell us something about a player's mindset, but we don't always know who's running these accounts, and I think history has proven that it's not entirely predictive, that a lot of things have happened on social media that indicated something was going to happen in real life, and it didn't go that way. So you really can't use what you think to be evidence based on somebody's follower count or follower makeup or things that happen on social media and then apply that to what's going to happen in the future. Cause there haven't been a lot of examples of that proving to be, you know, a, a credible source. Trayvon Diggs or Stefan Diggs, who, uh, would you trade them straight up? I think the bills are pretty solid at cornerback. So I don't know if I would make that move straight up. I was but being, I, think, I was being facetious, I mean, but I think the number be a one fun corner trade. is probably more valuable than the number one receiver. I don't know. That's debatable. Tra- oh, Trayvon Diggs is overrated. I know he had 11 interceptions a couple of years ago, which I think led the league, but uh, he's overrated. Should he the bills ever, consider- the reason he had 11 interceptions is because teams throw at it a lot. They didn't last year, but anyways, is Stefan right. Diggs' talent and happiness important enough that the Bills should consider making a move for Trayvon Diggs simply for that purpose? To keep him happy, to keep Stefan, to keep the Diggs brothers together. Yeah. Or if Stefan yeah. Diggs, I mean, it does seem there are hints that they want to play together and that it's either going to involve the Bills bringing Trayvon Diggs to Buffalo or the Cowboys bringing Stephon Diggs to Dallas. Maybe they team up together on another team at another time in another universe. That's an interesting question. I would I would say that the Bills would not accommodate that because Stephon Diggs, why would you want to keep him happy at 32? Uh, why would you bend over backwards for a cornerback who is susceptible to double moves to keep your 32-year-old receiver happy? However... It is the type of move I could see the Cowboys making uh, because Jerry Jones is is uh, seems prone to that type of thing. Bringing in a receiver who has star power, who might be on the downside of his career. Uh, and I don't know. It just it seems like a Cowboys move to me. Yeah, absolutely. Doesn't, doesn't seem like a Brandon Bean move to me. Although Brandon Bean and uh, and, and uh, Jerry Jones uh, have, you know, both working for the Bills. After this, uh, you know, the well, the bill, the Bills chose Legends to be the concessionaire for the new stadium over uh, local company Delaware North, uh, which I wrote about uh, last week. And but Legends has been doing a lot of other stuff, the PSLs, some of the uh, you know, hiring and construction stuff and consulting and sponsorships and whatever marketing Legends, took over I'm the Bills mistaken. store. Very involved in the PGA Championships in Rochester. I'm sorry, Delaware North was involved with the concession. No legends. I think was very involved in the concessions and the 
um, whenever the event production of the PGA Championship in Rochester. Well, Delaware North has the PGA um, has the PGA um, contract, so Delaware North was there and they handle all that stuff. So I don't maybe. Oh, I could be incorrect. Some, I, I thought the business. I, thought I saw some signage. I don't maybe could be wrong. We could just edit uh, that out somewhere. Well, uh, Matt Ariza. Matt Ariza gets a workout with the Jets. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, my, my first thought in a way is I say not necessarily good for him, but at some point, you know, he does have to go on with his life and he's not going to be criminally charged. I don't know if – I don't have a strong take on whether Matt Ariza belongs in the NFL or if a, a team should sign him or should not sign him. But – you know, I don't know if we need to be in this situation forever where we're, you know, wondering whether he belongs. I mean, if, if NFL teams decide they're okay, he he's, hasn't been charged with any crimes, and it doesn't seem like any of that's coming towards him, I think it's time to, you know, move on and, and go forward. Civil lawsuit is still active. Um, I had to get confirmation of that yesterday, so I reached out to the accuser's attorney. Uh, he tells me that it is not only active, but they will be refiling it. By, uh, and adding uh, two more defendants. Uh, I don't know anything more than that, but that's uh, that's the latest uh, that I've heard. Uh, told uh, from the accuser's attorney, Dan Gillian. Uh, uh, Ariza, through his attorneys, have been setting up uh, different media uh, 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 opportunities, I guess, for him. Uh, interviews that he's been doing nationally. He's been making the rounds, trying to clear his name. Uh, and I think that whoever deserves vindication, uh, I hope they get it. Uh, Matt Ariza, at the moment, and we we talked about it on a previous podcast, he's still admitted to doing some things that are unsavory, perhaps not illegal. Um, are they questionable? I guess that's up to wherever your personal line is. And it, it's going to be to wherever a team's uh corporate line is and what they want to deal with in terms of public relations, if they want to answer these questions, uh, if they feel that it is a fit within their locker room that they can handle such a thing, um, then they'll bring them in. And um, so I, I understand the, uh, the, the pushback from people who feel that he was uh, uh unfairly punished by losing his career, uh, by having his reputation damaged. Um, but it appears as though uh, after a year away uh, that he is starting to get uh, NFL interest again. Uh, but I also, you know, it, public relations is a big thing uh, with businesses. The NFL is incredibly uh, mindful of public relations and image and each individual team has its own criteria in addition to whatever the NFL as as uh, uh, as as a, as is its own entity. They have their own uh, thoughts on what the shield should represent. And um, so, I, yeah, I think it'll be difficult whether he was charged or not. Some of the things that he did admit to, some of the things that he was accused of. Um, I think teams don't want to have to deal with that, um, especially for a sixth round pick at a position that is as fungible as punter. So I think that's unfortunate for him. And, um, you know, I think that's, it's, it's, uh, it's playing itself out. He got himself in a, in a situation that, uh, that uh, he's, he's been struggling to undo. Uh, for what a year and a half now it appears um yeah i just i, I think to clarify my point I, I think that without making my own or our own personal judgment on matter raises guilt or innocence or what he is what he may have done or did not do and how bad that was i think that at this point with no charges no nfl personal conduct suspension NFL teams now make their own public relations calculus and their own um, beliefs over whether they, you know, believe Matt Areza committed a crime or not. 
And at that point, whether they bring him in or not, I, I guess I just, I don't know if as a fan, as an observer, we can just make the knee-jerk assumption that Matt Ariza did this or that and should never play football again. Because I don't think that professional sports is only reserved for the most moral of all the athletes, that there are right. mixes of personalities and character flaws, and we're all on this spectrum as human beings, and that I just don't think you can keep everybody out of the league that might have an unsavory allegation against I them. I interviewed O.J. Simpson. I sat down with O.J. Simpson and interviewed him about football on multiple occasions. I've been in Don King's living room. People who have done heinous things um, are still in the sport in the sporting world and they are influential and duly and do all kinds of things that still require us to interact with them. And, and if, if he ends up, if Matt Ariza ends up with the jets or even if he's back at the bills, there's going to be occasion to where we'll have to interview him. Obviously I'm not putting him in that category. I'm just using that as uh, an anecdote, you know, whether it was heck, um, let, let's say something. Uh, who who is the the guy who punch who sucker punched Geno Smith? And I think I just and Impali. I K and Impali just to troll the Jets. Doug Whaley and Rex Ryan picked him up off waivers. I mean, there's all kinds of unsavory or people who've done stupid things that we have to um, still deal with. I mean, and there's you know people who have you know, domestic violence, um, you know, vehicular homicide. Uh, you know, there's, yeah, I mean, I don't need to, I don't need to believe that point, but. Um, yeah. And pl players that have been suspended for all or part of a season and then allowed back in the league the next year for awful crimes and admitted to it or were convicted and found guilty. It just seems to me at this point, unless there's more charges or more evidence and, and something new develops in this case, that if Matt Areza never plays in the NFL, based solely on these accusations that he's being held to a different standard than most every other football player that came before him. Maybe, maybe yes. And maybe no, let's keep in mind that he, but I will say maybe, all right. Perhaps. Yes, perhaps. But I think it's easy to also get to a point where you say he's a punter. There are so many unemployed punters out there. Um, he, was a sixth round draft pick. And while it is kind of unusual for punters to a lot of punters to be drafted, he wasn't even the first punter taken uh, in the draft. Uh, there are reasons that he might not make it. And let's also remember that kickers and punters, both um, long snappers too, have a tendency to need to get cut three or four times before they even stick on a I mean, Think of all the, the kick, they're vagabonds. I mean, these are guys who have to try out, uh, you know, for years and years and years until they've honed their skills to the point where a team is comfortable enough to keep them. Or even if they are kept, maybe it's a, they're only around for the first month and a half of the season. All it takes is a couple of shanks and we're sorry, we can't trust you. We got to bring in somebody else. I, I, I would be fascinated to see if there ever is a lawsuit and he has mentioned that he may sue either the accuser or the accuser's attorney for hurting his career, how they would calculate, how they would do the, um, the, the damages uh, for being a punter uh, that was cost an opportunity because the other side could easily say, okay, you take the greatest, you know, punters in the NFL right now. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that they were granted or, or guaranteed anything because you have to bounce around the, 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 traditional tra trajectory of a punter is getting cut many, many times kickers too. So it would be fat. I'd be fascinated just from a, from a legal standpoint and also from a football standpoint, what, what would go into that calculus of uh, uh, what do you call it? What's the uh, what's that line of work uh, called? Um, hell Matthew Fairburn's brother even does it. Uh, the actuary um, tables. Actuary. Yeah. Doing an actuary table on uh punter uh, and how much was, was cost. And he's actually trying out for the jets now. So that would actually probably work against him uh, in which somebody could look at it and see, look, you're still getting opportunities. Teams are working you out. Um, anyways, that's fascinating to me just, and that has nothing really to do with the case or why he's out, but, but just the idea of 
punters. What is the true value of a punter's career? Um, it's Pat McAfee. Let's ask him. <laughs> right. He's, uh, I guess it depends on what you do after your career. Uh, Pat McAfee, uh, one of the r- richest media members uh, in, in the sports uh, journalism world. Um, tell us about Anquan Bolden Jr., former Bills receiver, uh, finger quotes, Anquan Bolden. Uh, his son uh, is going to play basketball at UB. What do you know about him? Well, I've never seen him play, so I don't, I don't know that much about him. I know he's a 6'4 guard that UB got a commitment from, from IMG Academy in Florida, which generally produces good players. So, And because of the bloodlines and son of an NFL player, you would imagine he's a very athletic guard and it's 6'4". If he has Anquan Bolden type size, strength, and athleticism, that actually seems like a, a good get for a Mac player. In terms of his dribbling, shooting skill and ability, I don't know. It is intriguing to see UB building this roster with only five players coming back from the previous coaching staff's roster and, and what they had last year and going through the transfer portal and portal and getting commitments, junior college players and things like that. Um, but it's an interesting, it's a name, you know, it, it, Donovan McNabb's daughter never played at UB, but she did commit to UB before recommitting to Syracuse. That was interesting when there was that kind of connection and Anquan Bolden with his, I don't know, humorous history with the bills. I don't know how you'd really describe it, but, I thought that was one of the interesting things to put out there, you know, calling Anquan Bolden Jr. a former Bill and how that triggers some Bills fans to a a very predictable response. It it was an amusing thing. And it'll be kind of interesting if his son ends up coming to Buffalo and having a good experience and living here and playing here and being a well- It also would be funny if he transfers before he plays. Well- Or decommits. It would be too. It would be too. Or maybe Anquan Bolden being UB basketball dad and he ends up spending more time in Buffalo in that role than he did as a uh, you know a football player on the Buffalo Bills roster for however many weeks. Let's think away. about that. Who are some famous dads who have had college kids? So you had Paul Henderson's grandson playing at Canisius. Pat yeah. LaFontaine's son also played for a year at Canisius. Um, who was the Niagara dad? Played for the Knicks. Uh, Anthony Mason's son. Antoine right, Mason Anthony Mason. Uh this is a famous mom, but Nancy Lieberman's son, TJ Klein, played a year at Niagara before transferring to Richmond. Right. Um, you might remember more of these than I do. I mean, Kelvin Murphy's son played at Niagara for a year or two. That doesn't count because Calvin Mur- I'm I'm thinking about people who can't you like who weren't didn't have connections. Yeah, Calvin yeah. Murphy played. I mean, but Kelvin Murphy's not a local, so it was he came from Houston. It, but yes, you're right. Kelvin Murphy played. Donovan at McNabb's first. daughter would have been one. But I yeah, think I it's like there have more. been occasions where up. there's a famous person sitting in the stands watching I mean, their, their son some, or grandson. I mean, UB had uh, a running back, Brandon Thermalis. His father was Alonzo Highsmith. UB had a tight end, Chad Upshaw. His uh, uncle or grandfather, I believe, was Gene Upshaw. Might have been his father. I'd have to look that up. Um, so there have been connections. I, I feel like UB football's had a few more of these than, than the other teams that I can think of. But trying to think of them all off the spot. Uh, I can't think of them all. Yeah. People maybe uh, will throw some at us on the, on the Twitter machine. How about this? I spent about an hour of my night last night looking up uh, NHL draft prospect Gabriel Perot and whether he was related to Gilbert Perot, and he's not. But it took me quite a while of reading through and trying to confirm whether that was the case or not because if you look at where he's ranked, that would be a fun draft pick for the Sabres at number 13. It would be fun even if they're not related. Because of the name, give yep. him number eleven. Or no? Wait, what was it? Shoot. Why am I? Tr- what are the numbers? The French connection. Well, I mean, numbers. that's holy. Smokes. Well, so so that's a retired number. But would you end up? You probably wouldn't give him that number. That would be unwise, I think, to to give a young player that kind of weight of expectations. Maybe if they were related, that would be a, a conversation, a thing to think about, but I don't know if you'd want to do that to any young player. I just had a brain cramp because I had mentioned LaFontaine just five minutes ago, and when I said 11 for Perot, immediately the number 16 flashed in my head, and I had a little moment there where I I choked. Where well, I thought, 11's correct, but it. I wasn't 100% sure. That's why I got a little silent while I went and looked that up, but 11 is correct. 
Also, Bob McAdoo's number. So pretty famous Buffalo number. This Perot kid, is he in the ability? Maybe he'll be drafted 11th overall. Maybe. I think he's the number 10 North American skater right now and overall prospect-wise somewhere in the middle of the first round. Speaking of prospects, Marcus Harrison, St. Francis high offensive lineman going to Georgia. How, how big of a surprise was this? Well, he got offered by Georgia. So when it came to the point where he committed, not as surprising, but it was eyebrow raising when he got that offer. Cause this is a player, I believe he has 14 division one offers and other power five schools, Michigan state and some others. They, that's when it comes off the top of my head, but I believe Georgia was the only sec school recruiting him. And the only two-time defending national champion recruiting him or school of that ilk. And it is notable, it, you know, Western New York players get recruited by division one colleges and some really good ones get recruited by big time power five colleges, but they're usually in the big 10 or, you know, in that second tier, you know, top 25 teams, but not top five, top 10 teams. So they have the best team in college football the past two years that could, you would assume get any player they want in the country and to find one right here that they liked and they offered, and he's only a junior, uh, is notable. And I think I was talking to his coach, uh, Jerry Smith at St. Francis, and I think you'd have to go back to Doug Worthington in the early 2000s, was recruited by Ohio State when Ohio State was coming off a national championship season. Doug Worthington was also recruited by Alabama. He went to Ohio State, uh, played a bit in the NFL. Rob Gronkowski went to Arizona and had a lot of offers, but I don't know if the very best team, the Alabamas, the Georgias were really in on that. Uh, you know, it is rare to get to that level as a recruit, but when you're 6'8", 330 with a seven foot wingspan and you, you can move your feet, you play basketball. Uh, he's a shot putter. He comes from a cornfield in Iowa. He moved here, you know, when he was in sixth grade. I mean, he has a lot of things that, you know, offensive line coaches and recruiters would like. And the fact that he plays in Western New York, sometimes that does, keep players from being recruited at the top level, but it didn't in this case. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's a, a the competition level here uh, is historically considered subpar, but it does seem to me, and I, you, you would know better than I, football seems to be picking up a little bit, isn't it? I mean, I like, again, know. you just mentioned, you just gave a rundown about the power fives, but it seems like, It seems like more kids are going to the Syracuses and the Cincinnati's and the, you know, Mid American Conference. I, I don't know, maybe, but again, that could just be. I mean, maybe not. There, I mean, maybe not. I mean, there was. I mean, there were times there was right when now. Jehu Colcrick going to Michigan State and the Gronkowskis, as you said. You're right. You know, maybe I'm just talking myself out. I of think it. there might be a slight uptick. It also just might be with Twitter and commitments. We're seeing more of it. Um, I do think Western New York is still an under-recruited area and still an area where uh, recruiters in the SEC and big-time colleges don't come here to necessarily recruit the best players out of this area based on the competition level. It helps St. Francis players that they play out of state and they get tape against powerhouse teams in Pennsylvania and Ohio that helps in their recruiting. I still think to be a Western New York player and to get recruited, you have to get seen at a camp or you have to have the measurables and the frame and the size to be a, you know, what about the city schools though? The city schools have over the last 10 years have been producing well, some higher level, the Bennett program, and, uh, football players, yeah, the Bennett program, bring in so many different talented players together from around the city and players that maybe had previously gone to Canisius is having a moment and had three or four division one signees out of that team last year. and going to have even more and Damari Clemens, a, uh, soon to be a rising sophomore cornerback has a dozen or so division one offers. So yeah, I do think maybe there's an uptick, especially if you put it in light of the city of Buffalo and that Bennett program, but overall Western New York, I think it's about the same, but there's other sports, whether it's girls, basketball, lacrosse, baseball, that I think you could make that argument that you are seeing more and more division one NCA scholarship players coming out of this area that you did a generation ago. Um, I know that I, we teased uh, talking about Jesse Pagula. We also teased talking about the bandits. That's what I have here left on my list. Um, of course, the you know the French Open actually begins this weekend, Sunday, right? Uh, 
So Begins maybe we Sunday talk about that next week. I don't know. Number three where, where, seed for the Buffalo's third franchise, Jesse Pagula. Right. Uh, a major. Talk about her on the clay. Maybe we'll get a guest uh, to talk about Jesse Pagula. Uh, bandits, anything? You know, bandits are, they can, uh, they can't, they game game one in Buffalo game two in Denver game three, if needed back in Buffalo. So uh, I was talking with our friend, Matt uh, at Elmo's a bit of a dilemma because the third potential game is also star Wars night Mm -hmm. for the bisons and what to do. So the ECMC gala, it's going to be a traffic quagmire downtown that night. What gala? I was told, I think ECMC. I could right. be wrong. Well, at least that's that. not down. Where is that going to be? Whatever it is, it's a big event that draws a lot of people downtown Buffalo Saturday, June 3rd, the same night as Star Wars Night of the Bisons and potentially game three of the Bandits game, which they'll probably sell out. I, I think the crowds will be bigger than they've been for the previous playoff games that have been around 12, 13, 14,000 people. But I don't know. I'm not a urban planner or a traffic control cop, so I don't really have to worry about that other than getting down there myself. Which would you cover, the Bandits? I think so. But yeah, yeah, the Bandits would be a championship game, and as much as Star Wars Night's kind of a big event for the fans, I mean, I don't know. It's not really a sports story. It could be, but it's not the biggest sporting event going on in town. And I'm not covering the ECMC gala. Well, I'm rooting for game three, uh, so that way Buffalo can win on its uh, home turf and also to create a little chaos downtown. Let's see what happens. Yeah, and I, and I hope think it's a so, beautiful right. day. Without rooting for necessarily rooting for the Bandits to win, I think if they are going to win this series, it would be better for it to happen in game three at home than for it to happen in game two on the road or alternatively better than – the bandits getting swept in the first two games and losing in game two on the road. I think you at least want that third game back in Buffalo. And if they win it, they win it at home. And if they don't, and that's what happened last year. And there's a Western New Yorker, Zeddy Williams, who's the best player on the Colorado mammoth. And last year, the bandits won game one, then lost game two in game three. And, and, you know, Colorado celebrated a championship in Buffalo and that scenario could play out again this year. Jonah, thanks for this. Um, We'll do it again soon. Any parting words? Nope. That's it. All right. Good enough. Thanks to everybody out there for listening or watching Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK CPAs and business consultants. Subscribe, like, tell your friends. Oh, 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 oh,